Zeus sire. Be king of Phrygia one day and tax my hilltop cousin, Lord Anchises, of some beef, <laughs> but that is all. So do not trust the gods too much, young man. Gods fail their worshippers, but not themselves. Your chair is here, sire. Priam turns. They go. Like monumental wings, the doors that overlook the Acropolis main court open onto the evening air and Priam's portico. And when his chair appears, with four sons walking by each arm, Neomab, old Seuss's next, declares, All rise for Priam, Laomedon's son, great king of Troy and lord of Ilium. Old Priam seats his council of a hundred with his hand, gathers his strength and cries, Where is my son, my only son? I do not see my son. He has no twin. Take all my sons, Achilles, but not him. But only to himself. Aloud, he says, I reign with understanding for you all. Antino, as the eldest, will speak first. Our question is, how can we win this war? And I reply, Antino, standing, says, how can we lose it? God's Troy has been besieged a dozen times, but never taken. Your line goes back 900 years, the Greeks have been here nine. Surely their chance to take your city worsens in the tenth. Anchises' face is stone. His kinsman, Panda, spits. If we have difficulties, so do they. If we are tired, so are they. And we are tired at home, behind our wall. These are their facts. Full tents, thin blankets, gritty bread, with agitators poulticing their weariness. And one thing more, they have a case. Their law of hospitality is absolute. You are guest, you are king, the house is yours. Paris, may God destroy him, was Menelaus' guest, and Helen was, is, Menelaus' wife. He wants her back, Greece wants her treasure back. Neither unreasonable demands. Women are property for them and stolen property can be returned. Panda would interrupt, but Merobd, Aphrodite's priest, restrains him. My king, the winners of a war usually get something out of it. What will we get? Their camp, their ditch, and who wants those? Only Lord Kopfrafag, the god of shit. Dear, my dear lord, some here would garrison the clouds in case we are invaded from the moon. Impatient now. Stand Helen on a transport piled with gold, supplied by Paris, covered with silk, frogged with pearl, likewise supplied. And as they rumble through the Skian gate, let trumpets from its terracing bray charivari to her long white back's disgusting loveliness. Applause. And under it, where can that Hector be, the old king asks, on his way here, sire, from the temple. As Antenor ends, Achilles is no different from the rest. Let him face stone, sixty by thirty feet of it, height before width, our dam, the wall, the death of Greece. Keep its gates down and send our allies home. Since men have lived, they lived in Troy. Why fight for what is won? Now more, too much, applause, into the last of which. This is the why, Anchises, Lord of Ida, said, as Panda and Didnum, Panda's bow slave, helped, then held him up. For sixty years ago, as he was swimming in Gargara's lake, my lady Aphrodite glimpsed his buttocks cusp and had him in a drift of asphodel. 
that done, she pushed his hair back off his brow and took his hand and spoke to him by name. Anchises, I am fertile. Our son, who you will call Aeneas, shall be king. But sight our bond to anyone but him, you will be paralyzed from the waist downwards. For I am Aphrodite, love irresistible, a god among the gods. Heaven always asks too much. Just as Anchises said, This is the why, one day he grinned at those who claimed a newborn temple maid to be as good as Aphrodite and said, She's not, I know, because I've had them both. And as they laughed, shriveled from hip to foot. Withered or not. This is the why, Anchises said. Troy is not Ilium, and without Ilium, Troy will not last. You say, give Helen back, they will go home. Oh, sorry, orator, they have no home. They are a swarm of lawless malcontents hatched from the slag we cast five centuries ago, tied to the whim of their disgusting gods, knowing no quietude until they take all quiet from the world, ambitious, driven thieves. Our speech, like footless crockery in their mouths, their way of life, perpetual war, inspired by violence, compelled by hate. To them, peace is a crime, and offers of diplomacy like giving strawberries to a dog. Indeed, what sort of king accepting theirs would slit his daughter's throat to start a war? King Priam yawns. They must be beaten, preferably destroyed. Return their she, her boxes, they will think, Ilium is weak, and stay. Retain them, they will think, Ilium is fat, and stay. As either way they want your city whole, your wives, your stuff and stock flood lit by fire, while they pant in their stinking bronze and lick their lips. Ask Hector's wife. Andromache has lost her sire, King Etion, four brothers, and their town, Shady Kalikiax, at Achilles' hands. She will not underestimate the lad's ferocity. He is what they call best, that is to say, proud to increase the sum of human suffering, to make a wife, a widow, widows, slaves, hear before laughter, lamentation, burn before build. Our only question is how best to kill him. Panda has planned for that. The saying goes, not the dog in the fight, but the fight in the dog, and you, Antino, have no fight. You speak from cowardice, you plan from fear. Then Panda's true was mixed with someone's shame, shame, merged with answer him, and fool with stand. Their voices rising through the still, sweet air. As in the spring of 1961, Ellie and Hugo Klaus and I smoked as we watched the people of the town of Skopje stroll back and forth across their fountain square, safe in their murmur on our balcony one dusk. Not long before an earthquake tipped themselves and their society aside, now, almost by touch, the council's tumult died, as gowned down the flight that joins temple to court, surrounded by Troy's dukes, his sacrifice complete, Prince Hector comes. Whether it is his graceful confidence, his large and easy legs and open look that lets him fortify your heart, that makes you wish him back when he has gone, Trusting oneself to him seems right, who has belief and your belief respected where he stands. My son! No sound aside from Priam's cry, as Hector led Chilaborak, Andromache's one brother left, King Etion's heir, across the courtyard. Plus Aeneas, 
brave, level-headed, purposeful. Troy's Lycian allies, Glaucus, beside his prince Sarpedon, Anaxipart, Sarpedon's armourer, and more as valiant, as keen for fame, the plumes of Ilium that you will meet before they die, followed their Hector up onto the portico before the monumental wings, and stood around the king, who pulls his son's face down and kisses it, even as he whispers, Where have you been? And Hector lets the smile this brings fade from his lips before he says, My friends, your faces bear your thoughts. Change them for these. My name means he who holds. Troy, Ilium, Troy beyond. One thing. The victory is God's. Anchises harms the truth by making it offensive. Antino hides the truth by making out Greece has already lost. God, break the charm of facts, excepting these, that we are sick and tired of the wall, of waking up afraid, of thinking Greece, your life in danger all your life, never to rise alone before the birds have left their nests, then ride through sunlit, silent woods, deep snow to spring flowers in a single day, and then the sea. To miss these things, when things like these are your inheritance, is shameful. We are your heroes. Achilles' name, that turns you whiter than a wall, says this. Although his mother is a god, he is a man, and like all men, has just one life, can only be in one place at one time. It will be plain to see whose part heaven takes, if God guides Hector's spear cast or if not, if God is pleased with Hector or if not, if not, it is a manly thing, an honourable thing, to die while fighting for one's country. Be sure. I know it is the plain that leads us to their ships and them to the sea. And when God shows the moment we should strike, I will reach out for it. But I, not you Anchises, and not you Antino, will recognise that moment when it comes. All to their towers. Sleep tight. But do not oversleep, or you may miss your full Greek breakfast. Did our applause delay him? Out of the corner of his eye, Chilaborak sees a strange herald cross to Neomab and Seuss. Then Seuss make not now signs to Neomab. Then Neomab, apologizing with a shrug, go to Priam and his dukes who ring him, and, while our silence holds, listen then nod, then face ourselves just before Seuss declares, Crises of Ptolemon sends this news. Achilles has walked out on Greece. Tomorrow he sails home. So I am right. So I am right in unison, Antino and Anchises called. And so again, as in that fountain square, true, shame, right, answer him and stand, became the cross-talk of their dark that grew slowly and slowly less until all were as quiet as children drawing. Then Hector said, Listen to me and take my words to heart. This changes nothing. I lift my hands to God whose voice knows neither alien head nor land. He is my word, my honour and my force. I shall bury Greece. And went. Immediately below the parapet of Troy's orbital wall, wide, house-high terraces descend like steps until they mill the flagstone circus ringing its acropolis, whose acre top supports the palace, walk and wall, rooms by the flight where Priam's fifty sons slept safe beside their wives before Greece came. The temple faces south. 
And over there, beyond the columns looking down, notice the stairs that wind onto a balcony where Helen stands and says, They want to send me back. And, taking a pastry snail from a plate inlaid with tortoise shell, Paris, who caused the war, replies, Heaven sent you here. Let heaven send you back. While in his sleep, King Priam shouts, You are too faithful to your gods. Cut to the flat-topped rock's west side, and see Andromache touch Hector's shoulder. My love, I am a good and patient wife. I speak the truth. My father was a king, yet when he slaughtered him, Achilles did not rubbish Etienne's corpse, but laced him in his plate and lifted him, as tenderly I do our son, onto his pyre, and let our twelve-year-olds plant cypresses around his cairn before he burnt leafy Kilikiaks and led them to his ships. Distrust cold words. Friendship is yours, and open-heartedness. I hear your step. I smile behind my veil. To measure you, to make your clothes, your armor, or to forge your blades is privilege in Troy. You fear disgrace above defeat, shame before death. And I have heard your bravery praised as many times as I have washed my hands. Be sure of it, as you are sure of me, as both of us are sure, courage can kill as well as cowardice, glorious warrior. Then, as they walk along the pergola toward the tower of the Scian Gate, shadowed by Rymph and Rimina, her maids, her wedding present from Chilaberac, both honoured to sleep Hector if he chose. Half Troy is under twenty, love. Half of the rest are wounded, widowed, old, harsh, raising her finger to his lips. Why else does Prince Aeneas take a boy as young as Manto in his car? Aeneas is my business. Silent. Then... My lord, you never yet treated me like a woman. Do not start now. Your family quarrels are your own. And walked before her skirts that trailed along the floor before him through the horseshoe arch into the tower's belvedere, retied the threads of her veil at the back of her head, smiled Rimina and Rymph away, then said, Dearest, nearest soul I know, you hesitate to fight below your strength. Short work, therefore, to needle Hector with the thought it was the weakness of the Greeks and not his strength that kept them out, that kept them down, that sent them home. But those who say so preach, not prove. Why, sir, even if you sent Sarpedon, Glaucus, and Anaxapart back home to Lycia, Aeneas to his hills, prior to shouldering Agamemnon's race into the Dardanelles alone, those preachers would not change their tune. Day after day I wash Greek blood off you. It teaches me that Greece is not so far and not so strange to be exempt exhaustion. Send Helen back. Let her establish a world record price. Desire will always be her side effect. And Achilles is out. Oh, love, there is a chance for peace. Take it. We all die soon enough. Hi, ye daughter of Etienne. From diadem past philtrum on to peeping shoes, you show another school of beauty. And while he looked over the Trojan plain towards the fleet, your Hector said, I know another way. 
as moonlight floods the open sky. Now all creation slept, except its lord, the shepherd of the clouds, who lay beside his Juno queen with Thetis on his mind. So to a passing dream he said, Go to the... Enter its king. Tell him this lie. Strike now and you will win. Zeus, lake-eyed queen, has charmed the gods and thrown a great naught over Troy. Disguised as Nestor's voice, the dream sank into Agamemnon's upside ear and said, Lord of the shore, the islands and the sea, you know my voice, you know I speak the truth. You are God's king, he pities you, and is as always on your side. These are his words. Strike now, hero and host, as one, and you will win. My lake-eyed queen has charmed the gods and drawn a great naught over Troy. And as its host awakened, the dream died. Heralds to Agamemnon's tent. Bright apricot rifts the far black. They bow. Fetch my great lords, then have your less assemble Greece. And as Talthibius did, Dawn stepped barefooted from her lover's bed and shared her beauty with the gods, who are as then and with ourselves as now. Outside, Pylos and Salamis and Caledon, Crete, Sparta, Thessaly, Tiryns, Ithaca, formidable. Even a god would pause, but not himself. I have important news. An hour ago, dressed in your voice, dear lord of Sandy Pylos, God came to me and said, Make total war today, hero and host, as one. Troy will be yours by dusk. The dawn wind pats their hair. Odysseus gazes at his big left toe. His toe. Until Idomeneus said, then you awoke, my lord? I did, and sent for you at once. A pause. Then Nestor said, You say it had my voice. It did. My normal voice? Your normal voice. The voice that you hear now, as now, nobody speaks. Well? Nobody. Alone on the beachhead's eastern reach, Stentor is calling Ajax's men to the assembly. Then Diomed. My lord, excuse my age. Young as I am, I wish to ask you if, by as one, by total war, you mean us lords to fight beside the less? I do. My lord, I am the child of kings. And we are not. My lord, my uncle Meliager slew the mammoth hog that devastated Calydon. My father died while fighting for your own against the eyeless tyrant Oedipus of Thebes and his incestine heirs. Of course, you are delighted by the thought of taking Troy without Achilles 
and that our mass must fill the gap that righteous Lord has left. But, sir, why should I fight alongside my inferiors? The mass is cowardly. Bread from the instruments of those our ancestors evicted or destroyed, bronze is for them to polish, not to wear. Better be born a woman, leaky, liking to lose, or a decent horse than one of them. Bitter, but better, fetch Peleus' son. Tiptoe around him, pick one's moment, plead, than share our triumph with our trash. Everyone looks in a different direction. Then Nestor said, Paramount Agamemnon, had anyone except yourself so dreamt, I would have begged him not to mention it. But as things are, we will inspire both lords and less to fight for you. As for yourself, young sir, remember that I fought beside your father. And he would say this, what heaven has ordered, heaven can change. If God says total war, total it is. See sheep in Spain. The royal flock, taking five days to pass you as they wind white from their winter pasture up onto the Whitsun prairie of Castile, wrinkle its brow and weed with even pace that sunny high so that their collies seem to chase the passing sky. Muter than these, but with as irresistible a flow, the army left its line and walked over the slipways in between the keels, along the camp's main track beside the ditch, and Stentor's less settled them round the sand. Still. Then Talthibius. Absolute silence for the son of Atreus, Agamemnon of Mycenae, king of kings. No warmth in the sun as yet. Soldiers, he said. Dressed in Lord Nestor's voice, our Lord and God, whose voice dethrones the hills, entered my head an hour before the dawn. These were his words. Yours is the greatest army ever known. Assault Troy now, hero and host, as one, and by this time tomorrow all its flesh and all its fat will be your own to stow as you prepare to sail for home. For I, your God, as I have ever been, am on your side. After nine years, no throat that did not ache then would not cheer hearing such things. Yet as hope rose, so did Thersites, and in his catchy whine said, King, God may be on your side, but if he is on mine, why is Troy still standing over there? Then Captar Titter, How? Us, being the greatest army ever known, though we outnumber Troy by three to two, have we not won the war? As for our sailing home, review the fleet with me. But, O oh my lord, please do not fart. You are a powerful man, and perished sails blow out. Then, when, us having scanned the shrouds, my lord, you stroke your chin and rest your expert eye, resist the urge to lean against a mast. They are so rotten you can push a walking stick clean through them. As he wades through our knees down to the front, he says, Son of a truce, you astonish me. You ask the Greeks to fight in a main vein for you, yet rob the man our victory depends on. What do you want? More bronze? More sheaves? Your tents are full, and yet... Turning to us... Who was the last man here to hear Lord Agamemnon of Mycenae say, Have this, some plate, brave fighter, or share this? One thing is sure, that man would be surprised enough to jump down the eye hole of his own knob. 
Why laugh? Achilles is not laughing. The lords have let their king grab his mint sheet. Nor is Achilles cross. Achilles shows restraint. If he did not... Back to the king. My lord, you would be dead. Our shoulders rise and fall. Something is going to happen. Soon. And from the middle sand, Thersites shouts, I have important news. God is on Agamemnon's side and on the side of his great underlord. Comrades in arms with God, why such a team can take Troy on its own and need not share its triumph with its trash? So, tea to his tablespoons, as he needs us no more than our Achilles needs snot on his spear pole, we are free to go. Go where? Go home. And here some run to him. Go home at once, the host, as one. And raise his hands. By noon we can be rowing, seeing this hopeless coast fade. Hold his fists high as... Home, home, home. We answered him, all standing now beneath. Home, home. All darkened by that word, a sudden gust darkened the surface of a lake, or passing clouds a hill, or both a field of standing corn. We flowed back through the ships and lifted them, our dust, our tide, and lifted them, our tide, hulls dipping left, now right, our back, our sea, our masts like flickering indicators now, knees high, now lift, knocked props, now lift again, and our relief, our sky, our liberty, as each enjoyed his favourite thoughts, his plans, and to a Trojan watcher we appeared like a dinghy club, now moored on mud, now upright on bright water, and now gone. So Greece near crowned its fate and came safe home, except the gods, whose presence can be felt, for whom a thousand years are as a day, said, no. Quicker than that, at Hera's nod, Athena stood beside Odysseus and ran her fingers down his spine. Oh, we see him move, taking his driver, Bombax, into their flight, like flight, and saying, wrap that dog, hand Bombax his crimson boat cloak, and then leap onto a tilting deck and spread his big bare feet and cast his landslide voice across the running beach. And she... Athena of the ash come tungsten eyes divided Lord Odysseus' voice into as many parts as there were heads, so each lord heard, You are the best. You hold your ground. You were born best. You know you are the best because you rule, because you take and keep land for the mass, where they can breed and pray and pay you to defend them. You to see custom done, you lead the less, you hold your ground. So that mass heard Odysseus' charming voice. Be fair, the plague has gone. Odysseus wise. Even if all Thersites says is true. His firm. The lords are going to stay. Odysseus practical. You know the sea? Odysseus hard. Cackhead, get back into your place. Hearing these things, the soldiers slowed, looked at each other's faces, looked away, looked at the water, then about, and turned, returned, and turned again, chopping and changing like a cliff-stopped sea whose front waves back into the one behind that slaps the next that slaps. Bombax has got the Cites in Odysseus' cloak and roped it round, and as he humps it up the beach, it starts, and those who watch it pass feel scared. Some minutes pass, and then, with his big, attractive belly rounded out, just a trace of dark grey hair ascending and descending to his cloth, Odysseus, half casually, holding a broomstick cane, half casually, walked over to the still occasionally jerking item Bombax dropped some minutes past onto the middle sand. Then, stoop, stand, heave, 
Lift Odysseus slewed Thersites out, who knelt, who tried to slip his gag, then did. Speak out, Odysseus said. Think of your crowd. As they brought you to life, because of you they see themselves as worthy of respect, to have a voice. No, not a word. You must have something to complain about. No sound. Then there, old soldier, I can help you out. And raised the cane and gave Thersites neck, nape, sides, back, butt, stroke after slow, accurate stroke. And pain, lewd pain, a weeping pain, your smash hit, high reliability, fast forward pain. Then passed the cane to Bombax, took back his cloak, helped poor Thersites up, and said softly to him, but also to ourselves, Back to your place, Greek. Let me hear that voice of yours again, and I will flog you naked from Lord Ajax's ships at one end of our beach to Lord Achilles at the other. As for Thersites, our shoulders parted, and he sat, touching his welts with one and with the knuckles of his other hand, wiping his tears away. And as it is with soldiers, sad as we were, a laugh or two went up, as one nod murmured to the next, Odysseus is about to speak. Some say the daylight sharpens where he stands because Athena guards him. And so we see her now, like an unnamed intelligent assistant standing a touch behind him on the left. Talthibios said that those far off may hear as well as those close to full silence for prudent Odysseus, the lord of Ithaca. He keeps his eyes well down and turns his words towards King Agamemnon. Gulls. True king, Odysseus said. No Greek believes more firmly than myself that all occasions are at God's command. As God gave you our king of kings to us, so you are given the best of all we take, and you through heaven ensure due custom done. Remember then, turning his voice on us, you who believe the last thing that you heard, who tell yourselves you think when you react, Captains in camp, but cowards on the plain, keen to be off, but frightened of the sea. You are not king. You never shall be king. You see a hundred Agamemnons. God sees one, and only one, who bears the mace, who speaks his word, who cares for us. So keep your democratic nonsense to yourselves, and when your better speak to you, obey. Idomeneo twists a fig of Merionis bunch. At the same time, all you who answered Agamemnon's call, be sure he knows how hard it is for Lord and lesser like to be away from home, stuck on some island, say, no wife, no she, even for a month, let alone years. But as he knows this, so he knows the world has no time for a king whose people leave him. Or would you have Thersites as your king? A horse swings its head at a fly. Of course you are impatient. So am I. Yet, as it is wrong to be found drunk at sacrifice, and wrong not to hold your father in your arms, consider how much worse would be to row with bowed heads home over the open graveyard of the sea and then walk empty-handed through the door. True! True! Those with the fleet at Orlis will recall King Agamemnon sacrificed his child, Iphigenia, plus fifty bulls, for us to have flat seas and following wind. And when their throats hung wide and we were kneeling by the smoky spring beneath its cedar tree, before its stone, a slug-white 
thigh-thick python slid out of the ferns that bit the stone, then glided through the lake of votive blood and up into the tree and searched its leaves. Eight fledgling sparrows chirruped in those leaves, and as we watched, the pythons sucked them in, then snatched their mother off the air, tainting our sacrifice, or so we thought. However, as the great snake fawned and periscoped above the cedar's crown, God stared into its eyes, and it was stone, white stone, figured with gold, tall, smooth white stone, a thing of beauty from a loathsome thing. Indeed, indeed. Then he who sees, is, was, and will, Calchas, now standing over there beside our king, said, as he will say once more, and sights his finger on that seer who gulps, who stands, who recapitulates. The time has come for Greece to praise its god, what we have seen means this, eight young, eight years before Troy's wall, but when their mother's summer ninth has come, victory over Hector will be ours. This is that summer, Lord Odysseus called, leaving the anxious Calchas on his feet. To waste our king's dream is to scorn our dead. So we strike now, hero and host, as one. Take Troy by total war and sail safe home. These were Odysseus' words, and as he sat, Greece rose and roared, Troy! 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 Echoing in the hulls along the dunes and rising through that likeness, this, Best do as Lord Odysseus says. The king is king. True, true. But we were not to blame. M mistake. Well, not to blame. Quite brave. Well, good on our feet. Certainly not to blame. Well, everyone else did. Did. While Agamemnon stood, fingering his collar bead, and when they settled, said... I thank the Lord that Greece has found its senses and hope it manages to keep them. The sea regards the sun. Similar silliness made me begin the quarrel with Achilles about some foreign she. Well, well, God's ways are strange. The sun, the sea, and now the former gives a little warmth. So, no regrets. This is the... The morning of the day whose dusk will see Troy won. The lords will join me for the battle sacrifice. The less will eat and arm. Never forget that we are born to kill. We keep the bloodshed to the maximum. And soon, swimming in Ilium's prosperity, each one of you will have a Trojan she to rape and rule, to sell or to exchange, and Greece will be revenged for Helen's wrong. And why, I cannot say. But as he sat, our answering cheer was like the wave foreseen when, crest held high, it folds and down cloud thunders up the shaken coast. The lords prepare to sacrifice, the less eat standing. Swifts flit from spear to spear. A hundred deep the lords surround their lords. Marianus, Idomeneus next, his eyes the colour of smoked glass. Odysseus, unthanked but unsurprised. Ajax, of course, and standing by him, little Ajax, like a side of beef, his brother by a purchased she. By him their cousin, Teucer. Dionid, just twenty-one. Thowell of Calydon, his hair like coconut, who always knows exactly what to do. And Menelaus, silent, doubtful, shy, watching his brother and Lord Nestor lead a huge red hog with gilded tusks into the ring. 
and all their world is bronze. White bronze, lime-scoured bronze, glass bronze, as if far out along some undiscovered beach a timeless child, now swimming homewards out to sea, has left its coit. The heroes kneel, then lift their palms. By Agamemnon's feet, Talthibia sprinkles barley, snips a tuft from the hog's nape, waits for the breeze to nudge it off his hand into the fire, surrounded by the heroes and their king, who prays. Force, Lord of Heaven, O dark immortal breath, hold back the night until I break into Hector's body with my spear, fill Troy with fire, and give its sobbings to the wind. Paian! Vouchsafe us Troy! Curls of high smoke as if the air was water. The heroes kneel, then lift their palms. King Agamemnon draws his knife. Its point goes in. Ah, me. God took your hog but spiked your prayer. Futureless spoons. His name is everywhere. His name is everywhere. And when the barbecue of fat-wrapped thigh cuts topped with light, and in its silver sea-dark wine had crossed your lips, Lord Nestor stood, and with concern for all, began. Today will be our longest day. But he was wrong. The engineers will top the rampart with a palisade, one pitch-length shipward from the ditch, which, while Thetis' son is not our front, will be our back. God stop that any Greek should die without hard fighting heavy fighting, and renown. So no more talk. Your king will arm. You lords will join the host, answering our clear-voiced heralds as they call, from mountain fastness, riverside or lake, farm, forest, lido, hinterland or shore, pasture or precinct, well or distant wall, by father's name or family name or lords, the long-haired Greeks, to battle with this cry. Lead on, brave king, as you have led before, and we shall follow. Immediately, wide-ruling Agamemnon's voices called Greece to its feet and set it on the move. And as they moved to mill-wheel tambourines and trumpet drums, the woman prince, ash-eyed Athena, flew her father's awning, called the Aegis blue, broad as an upright sky, a second sky, over their shoulders, rippling estuary, and turned the pad of tassel-ankled feet, the scrape of chalk on slate of chariot hubs, back on itself and amplified that self, contained its light, doubled its light. Then in that blinding trapped man behind man, banner behind raised banner, my sand-scoured bronze, my pearl and tortoise gold, and dear my God, the noise, as if the hides from which ten thousand shields were made came back to life and bellowed all at once. See how the hairy crests fondle each other onwards as from hill and valley, well and distant wall, all those who answered Agamemnon's call moved out, moved on, and fell in love with war again. King! King! As shining in his wealth, toting the solar mace, thighs braced against his chariot's wishbone seat stays, the shepherd of the host, lord of the shore, the islands and their sea, God's Agamemnon in his bullion hat, drove down their cheering front. King! King! Twenty thousand spears at ninety, some scaffolding poles full weight. Ten thousand helmets, mouth hole, eye hole, open face, chin strapped or strapless. Move! Move! Five thousand crests, T, fore and aft, forward curving, though either will do, some half-moon war horns. Move! Shields, posy, standard, eight oval eight or tower, one to six ply hide, some decked with bronze. Bows, single curve, lip curved, lip curves with reflex tip, tested, found arrow compatible. Keep up there! Blades, short, long, leaf, stainless, half rivet, set square, triangular, with rat tail tangs. These from Corfiat workshops, those imported. Chariots, 
good hay-fed car mares, each with her rug, these double as body bags. 400 tons of frozen chicken, their heads a world away. A green undercoat, and reaching the top of the swell in the plain. Now see the wall. Barbs, barbs plus spur, spades, beaded quivers, body paint, paste flecked with mica, arm rings, chapati wrapped olives, hemmed sheepskins, in case it gets cold without warning. King! King! And birth bronze, dust bronze, surgical bronze, mirror bronze, cup bronze, dove, seven parts copper to one part tin, down the low hill towards Tron.